All right, well, good evening and welcome back to Bible 101, BI 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, provided to you by the New Covenant College uh, through the Institute here at the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. Uh, tonight we come to week number four in our studies. Uh, last week, I'll remind you that we looked at the twin doctrines of infallibility and inerrancy. And I pray that the Lord blessed you with, uh, with that study. What an important battle that is for us in today's uh, world of Christendom to affirm that the Bible, not only is it without errors, but it is impossible for the Bible to even so much as contain error. And thus far, we've been following the logic of faith from one conclusion to the next. Uh, last week, we uh, talked about how the inspiration of Scripture necessitates the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. And then we considered all that's meant by those doctrines of infallibility and inerrancy. So tonight, we're going to go on to the next conclusion. Because infallibility is true, what must also be true? We've confessed that the Scriptures are without error. Uh, so what are the implications of that? Well, because it is impossible for Scripture to contain error, and because Scripture doesn't in fact contain error, Scripture is perfect. Scripture is perfect. So we're going to look at the perfection of Scripture tonight. The perfection of Scripture. And if you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 in the 96th verse. And you'll note that this chapter is all about the Word of God. In uh, just about every single verse, there is a direct reference to the Word of God, the law of God, the statutes of God, the standards of God, the, uh, the principles of God, the Word of God. And so we come to the 96th verse of Psalm 119. And the Bible says this, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Now the psalmist had seen many things in this world that could be rightly described as perfect. And surely God has made many perfect things that we can behold through general revelation. We can consider the biological perfection of the human cell, how God made mankind in such a perfect way, all of these intricate systems and bodily functions that work together in harmony. No mere chance could have ever produced such a perfect design. We can observe the cosmic perfection of the stars and the planets when we study the universe that we live in. What an amazing thing it is to see the natural world that God created. We can look at it and say, what a perfect creation. We can observe the created perfection of the majestic imagery in our own world, here on planet Earth, when we see a beautiful sun rising, or when we see a, a lofty mountain peak, or when we see a, 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 a for, forest valley, and we see the, the beautiful landforms that are on our Earth, we can conclude that they are perfect things. But as the psalmist says here in verse 96 of chapter 119, God's Word is more perfect than all of the perfect things this world may contain. He said, I've seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment, thy word is exceeding broad. It's, it's more perfect than anything else I've ever seen. Turn back in Psalm 119 to verse uh, 89. Psalm 119 and verse 89. The Bible says this, Forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou established the earth, and it abided. It abideth. This is the perfection of the word of God. Note with me, if you will, these verses. Forever, the psalmist begins in verse 89. This word is placed at the front of the verse to give it 
extra emphasis. See, forever the Word of God is settled. The perfection of God's Word is eternal. God's Word did not become inspired. It did not become infallible or inerrant. And it did not become perfect. God did not give His Word as a man might write something. We, we make a rough draft and there might be many errors and we go back and we revise and we edit and we improve. And then maybe at the end we come up with something that we can call perfect. Well, it was not so with the Word of God. The Word of God is eternally perfect. It did not become perfect through a series of revisions. Furthermore, the qualities of God's Word, infallibility and inerrancy, perfection and so on, these are the essence of what God's Word is. If you take those qualities away, it ceases to be God's Word. There was never a time when God's Word came into existence. But it has always been God's Word. Now, Scripture came into existence when God inspired men to record His Word. But before God's Word was ever inscripturated, it was already His Word. God's Word did not become His Word when He revealed it to man. God's Word did not become its Word when we received it. God forbid the, the neo-orthodoxy of the, of the Karl Barth uh, theology that says, well, it becomes God's Word when you receive it as such. Well, we want to avoid that kind of subjective, man-centered view of the Word of God. But what God revealed to man through Scripture was that which was eternally and is eternally His Word. We didn't know it yet, but it was already His Word. So the psalmist says, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. Then he says, O Lord, this truth caused the psalmist to break into praise. He was enraptured by the eternal perfection of God's Word. This is the response that the Bible should have upon our own hearts. We can know the Bible intellectually. We can know about it, know what it contains, know what it teaches. But it's another thing to know the Bible experientially, to have the Bible cut to the root of our heart. And I believe that's what happened to the psalmist here when he considered the eternal perfections of God's Word. He says, Thy Word is settled. This word settled, speaks of the intrinsic perfection of God's Word. It didn't become perfect over a period of time. And it's not now becoming perfect through a process of textual criticism. But the established perfection of God's Word is fixed, immovable, and permanent. This, this word settled uh, speaks of a final product. There's nothing to be added to it. There's nothing to be... Uh, no work needed to be done on it. It is complete. It's, it's, it's perfected. Where is it perfected? Where is it settled? Well, it's settled in heaven. In heaven. Now, look at verse 90. The psalmist says, Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. Now, God is the one who created the earth and fixed its times and its seasons. God is the one who's given us Summer, spring, winter, fall. If you're living in the south like I am, it, sometimes it seems like we don't have all those seasons. We just have summer, 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 and then winter, 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 winter. Uh, but yet God does give the seasons. God gives the rain. God gives the sun in the morning. God gives the moon at night. And He uh, established this earth thousands of years ago, and it still is abiding today. But the Word of God is not settled on earth in this sense, but it's settled in heaven. And I believe what the psalmist is saying is that if a sin-cursed world can be established and remain for thousands of years, how much more sure is the Word of God which is settled in a perfect and immutable heaven? Now some have taken this uh, verse to mean that the Word of God, though it is fixed in heaven, we can't ascertain it in its perfection on earth. But that's illogical and inconsistent. Uh, instead, what this passage is teaching is that we have access on earth to the perfect Word of God because it is settled in a perfect heaven. 
If the Word of God was exclusively settled on earth, it would be subject to all of the follies that this earth is subjected to. But no, friend, it is settled in heaven. And eternally was God's Word in heaven. And in due time, God revealed His Word to men on earth. So we are not receiving something that came by the will of man uh, through earthy men, but we are receiving something that came from heaven. Scripture possesses divine and heavenly attributes. It is heavenly because it is settled in heaven, and because Scripture originates with a perfect God and is settled in a perfect heaven, Scripture itself is perfect. One of the reasons why we affirm that the Word of God is infallible is because we said it comes from an infallible God. Well, one of the reasons why we affirm that the Word of God is perfect is because it's settled in a perfect heaven. Let me give you a, a couple areas of perfection that Scripture claims for itself. Scripture has a perfect source. Again, it comes directly from God. Scripture has perfect contents. The individual books and chapters and verses of the Bible are perfect. Scripture has a perfect Necessity. Scripture is necessary for saving knowledge of God and His Christ. Do you realize that the church would not exist without the Scriptures? We'd have nothing whereupon to covenant ourselves together by if it not for the Scriptures. You say, well, we would covenant around the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if not for the Scriptures, we wouldn't know the Lord Jesus Christ because through those Scriptures He is revealed to us. Scripture claims for itself a perfect authority. Scripture has a supreme and independent authority relying on nothing else for substantiation. The Bible needs no source outside of itself to validate any of its claims, uh, to prove any of its facts, or to hold together any of its stories and teachings. The Bible alone is its own authority. It appeals to nothing. But Scripture stands as the supreme judge over everything else. So it has a twofold authority. Scripture claims for itself a perfect truth. Everything contained in the Scripture is wholly true and characterized by truthfulness. Nothing in the Bible is false. Everything it purports, all of its numbers, all of its statistics, all of its dates, all of its timelines, all of its names, all of its stories, all of its doctrine is true. And sometimes, you know, we have this idea that we can somehow receive the quote-unquote important things while caving to uh, secular science and saying that some of those unimportant things can be false. Well, the Bible's not a buffet. We don't get the opportunity to take a little here and leave a little there. And we need not make excuses for God saying that, well, Yes, we admit that some of these things are false, uh, but the important things are true. We've just subverted the truth of the Bible and the authority of the Bible. God did not give us license to decide what in His Word uh, we believe is true and we believe is not true. You either receive it all, all 66 books, or you receive none of it. The Bible claims for itself a perfect integrity. Scripture is immune to error and corruption and perfectly trustworthy. Now, I'm not saying that a particular manuscript could be corrupted or cannot be corrupted. It can and it has, as we will see in the coming weeks when we study preservation. But when we say that the Scripture is immune to corruption, what we mean is that the Word of God being settled in heaven and delivered to earth can never in any one particular part be fully corrupted and lost. It's, it's, it has a perfect integrity. Scripture cannot be corrupted or distorted in its meaning. God has set divine protection on His Word so that men, though they may try to distort it, uh, though they may try to change it, though they may try to alter it, the integrity of God's Word will yet remain true and it will never be fully thwarted no matter how ill our intentions as human beings may be. Scripture claims for itself a perfect sanctity. It, it has a perfect holiness about it. 
Scripture reveals the history and the source of salvation. Scripture reveals the holiness of God and the source of the holiness of God's people. We would know nothing about holiness. We'd know nothing about morality. We'd know nothing about right or wrong. We'd know nothing about good or evil if not for the Scriptures. We would be lost in a sea of objectivity and moral relativism if we were not anchored in the sure foundation and the uh, uh, objective truth of the Word of God. Scripture claims for itself a perfect perspicuity. Perfect perspicuity. That's just a fancy word for clarity. Scripture illuminates and enlightens those who receive it by faith. Now that is not to say that there's not some difficult things to understand. There certainly are. Uh, the Apostle Peter even said that about the Apostle Paul's writings. He said that Paul has written some things that are hard to understand. And I say to Peter, Amen. And if you've studied the Apostle Paul's writings, you'll notice that there are some things that can be difficult to understand. And not just his writings, but other passages. Uh, we, you know, everybody likes to talk about the revelation of St. John uh, that, that was recorded there on the Isle of Patmos. We would say that there are some portions of Scripture that are hard to understand, but that doesn't take away from the pers perfect perspicuity of the Scripture. Because what that perspicuity means is that as a whole, this book is light. Uh, this book uh, shines in darkness. This book takes people that sit in darkness and it illuminates their hearts and it illuminates their minds and it gives them clarity. It gives them goggles through which to see the world. It gives them lenses through which to behold the character and the glory of God. This is a clear book. God did not write it so that we could be confused. God is not the author of confusion. That's why he says, study to show yourself approved. And I guarantee you, there is a correct an understandable interpretation of every single verse in this Bible. Now, will any man ever come to all of those perfect and correct interpretations? Well, probably not in this life. But we must believe that there is, in fact, truth behind every word that's written here and that it can be understood. There's nothing in here uh, where we just say, well, it's impossible for me to know what this is saying. No, you search the Scriptures. You study to show yourself approved. You trust the perspicuity of the Word of God and the illuminating grace of the Holy Spirit, and He'll guide you into all truth. What a comfort that is, that God has given us a book that we can understand. Scripture claims for itself a perfect efficacy. A perfect efficacy. Scripture accomplishes the will of God and His Word never returns unto Him void. Think about the Scriptures as the divine charter for the kingdom of God to go forth conquering and conquering spiritually the world under the authority of King Jesus. This is our marching orders. This is the marching orders of God Himself. He's told us in this book what He's going to do in the world. He's told us in this book, I'm going to save a people for my own name. I'm going to redeem them from sin. I'm going to renew this world. I'm going to reconcile all things to myself. We already know what God's going to do. He's told us in His book, and He's told us how we as His people are to take part in that work that He's doing. And how is it accomplished? It's accomplished through Scripture. As men come to believe the Scriptures, and they're trained by the Scriptures, uh, this, this is our application into the kingdom of God. This is our syllabus in the, in the class of, of the divinity of Christ. Uh, this is our coursework in God's school of discipleship. Uh, this is our final exam as all things in our life are tested by this book. Scripture is perfectly efficacious. And the Word of God never again returns void. That's why we need to understand that there's, God is doing much more in this world than just redeeming sinners from hell. I would say that what God is doing in this world is He's creating a people to worship Him and He's reconciling all things to Himself and redemption takes center stage in that plan. But God's doing much more than, than just that. He's reclaiming all of the universe for His own name. And so we need to understand that Scripture has multiple purposes. And so just because when the Bible is preached, it seems that no one is converted, we must not say, well, I guess the Word of God didn't accomplish anything this evening. No, it accomplished something. We might not be able to understand right off the bat what it accomplished, but it accomplished something because the Word of God is always efficacious.
And moving on, uh, I want to talk to you next about the perfect sufficiency of the Scriptures. I'll write that right here, sufficiency. It has been said, uh, as, I, as I told you in our lectures last week, the battle, especially in the 50s and 60s and 70s, was raging over the inerrancy and the infallibility of Scripture. Uh, many seminaries and Bible colleges in America did not believe in the infallibility of the Scriptures. And we thank God that He's raised up a whole generation of, of men and women who stood for the infallibility. And by and large, though there's still people that reject it, we can say that the church of Jesus Christ has pretty much won that battle in 2021. We're very thankful for that, that uh, really definitional to being a Christian is believing in the infallibility of the Scriptures. And I believe that that's a true definition of a Christian. He's one that believes that God's Word is without error. But others would say, and perhaps they're right, that in our day, we might be losing the battle over the sufficiency of Scripture. So if infallibility was the raging um, battle 50 years ago, in our day, our battle is over the sufficiency of Scripture. And I want to affirm to you tonight that Scripture, as part of its perfection, claims for itself a perfect sufficiency. It is a logical, faith-based conclusion of the perfection of the Bible. Because the Bible is perfect, that is, it is the complete Word of God, it must also be sufficient. Because the Scriptures are the totality of God's perfect Word, they and they alone are the sufficient uh, rule of faith for all life and godliness. I want to read to you again the statement made by our Baptist forefathers in 1689 in their confession. Chapter number 1 on the Holy Scriptures, which by the way, their declaration on the Holy Scriptures in chapter number 1 is, uh, is tremendous. Uh, there's actually a movement right now amongst Christians in, in uh, the states and in other places called the Confessional Bibliology Movement. And it's guys that uh, are reaffirming these historical beliefs about the preservation and the sufficiency and the infallibility of the Scriptures. And you have a lot of uh, guys today that are uh, uh, going for more critical text versions of the Bible and uh, departing from some of the historic beliefs and doctrines taught in bibliology and you have a movement today of guys saying wait a minute uh, we have been subscribing for these last several hundred years to these various confessions and these confessions of faith teach uh, a different uh, doctrine of bibliology than what's common amongst a lot of people who are also claiming to hold to these confessions uh, so when you, when you hear of these confessions, I want you to understand that this, these were written by men who held to a believing bibliology. And they say, chapter number 1, and in paragraph number 1, they say that the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. There it is right there, the foundation for our faith, for all that we believe and do as a church. It's the sufficiency of Scripture and the exclusivity of Scripture. Then in, in paragraph 1 and point number 6, or chapter 1, paragraph 6, they affirm the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture. So we see here that we as Baptist people and really as, as Christian people, uh, because this confession, though a Baptist confession, uh, would be largely agreed by uh, all varieties of Christendom uh, for the last 500 years, we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. It is the only certain, uh, infallible, and sufficient rule. This denotes the truth that was largely recovered at the Protestant Reformation Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura, uh, which was Latin for Scripture alone. You'll know that uh, 
that during that time period, there in the 1500s, the, the solas were recovered. And you had solus Christus, Christ alone, uh, sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. And holding all of that together and serving as the foundation was the doctrine of sola scriptura, scripture alone. And in the same way that infallibility necessitates perfection, so too does perfection necessitate the exclusive sufficiency of Scripture. And because the Scriptures are themselves complete and entire, uh, that is, they contain all that is needed by man, as we read there in uh, paragraph 6, it's all contained in Scripture, anything you'll ever need. Well, that doesn't leave room for anything else, does it? No, it certainly doesn't. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't use other things in our lives, right? I believe God uses the light of nature. He uses the works of creation. He uses divine providence to guide us. But nothing else is to ascend to the same level of authority as the Scriptures. Nothing else could possibly even be on the same plane as the Scriptures as far as our authority and our guidance in this Christian life that we live. The Scriptures alone have a place of preeminence. They are, for the Christian, the only rule of faith and practice. And again, this is something that we seem to be slipping from in our day and age, and we need to make sure that we champion this truth of the sufficiency of the Scriptures. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. You probably know right where I'm heading. Uh, these are familiar verses in our study of bibliology. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Look at verses 15, 16, and 17. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, general revelation will leave a man without an excuse, but only the scriptures make men wise unto salvation and convey all that they need to be perfect. There's no salvation apart from the scriptures. The scriptures alone contain the gospel message which must be believed upon in order to be saved. So whether you read it for yourself, whether a preacher preaches it unto you, how you find it doesn't matter as much as the fact that you must come to find the message of the word of God in order to know Jesus Christ. Now the, the verse here says that the scriptures are sufficient to make the man of God perfect, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now this word perfect, we don't uh, mean the same exact connotation as we do when we talk about the perfection of scriptures, but it's similar. What we mean is that it makes the man of God uh, or the woman of God or the, whoever be is believing in the scriptures in Jesus Christ, it makes them complete. It completes them. Those who have the scriptures, a Christian with his Bible is wanting for nothing. Now, you say, does that mean I don't need to join a church? Does that mean I don't need to receive the ordinances of baptism in the Lord's Supper? No, 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 no. But if you have the Scriptures, they will guide you into those things. So a Christian with his Bible, he's lacking nothing. He's got all he'll ever need for life and godliness. So it doesn't mean that it makes the man of God sinlessly perfect, but it makes him complete. There's not one doctrine you need to know that can't be learned in the Scriptures. There's not one reproof you need to hear that you won't find in the Scriptures. There's not one correction you need to receive that you won't get in the Scriptures. There's no instruction you must have that won't be provided in the Scriptures. There's no good works you need to perform that you won't be equipped to do by the Scriptures. These are things that can be said of the Scriptures and the scriptures alone. Nowhere does it say that your personal experiences or your opinions are profitable. 
for doctrine, for correction, for proof. Nowhere does it say that your dreams are profitable for doctrine, for correction, for proof. Nowhere does it say that your emotions are profitable. No, no, no. The scriptures alone are profitable for these things. So anytime people say, well, the Bible, I know what it says, but I know what I experienced. Well, friend, the scriptures must always take our final authority. And if we believe something happened to us or we think we've experienced something that contradicts the scriptures, we must just be mistaken. Because the infallible, perfect, sufficient scriptures are always the final judge in all matters of faith and practice. And this must be the case if we're to hold to an orthodox position on the Word of God, if we're going to affirm its sufficiency. These past few weeks we've been uh, laying bricks, we've been laying a foundation. And if you take away one of those bricks, the whole edifice of Christianity crumbles. If you take away the inspiration of the Scriptures, it crumbles. If you take away the infallibility of the Scriptures, it crumbles. And if you take away the sufficiency of the Scriptures, you leave a door open for all kinds of other junk to come in and all kinds of good things to come out. And that uh, structure will crumble. The Bible is always right. And when we have an idea or a, a whim that contradicts the Bible, we are always wrong. Last place I want you to turn, look at Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16. You know, in, in 2 Timothy, Paul says that the Holy Scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation. And I want to posit to you that the most important information that a human being could ever receive is how to know God. How to know God. I don't think anything could be more important than knowing that. Who is God? And how can I know Him? Well, where can a man find such information? Well, it's the Scriptures, is it not? Now, you're familiar with this story there in verse 16. The rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man, the Bible says, he lifted up his eyes in torment. And what did he ask? He said, send Lazarus or send someone from the dead to, to go and tell my family. And what was the answer? Look at verse 29. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 31, And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. What are Moses and the prophets? That's the Scriptures. It's the Old Testament Scriptures, but it's the Scriptures. And the Bible here says, oftentimes when we look at Luke 16, we, we teach on it from the perspective of heaven and hell. And I think that that's there, of course. But perhaps the main thrust of this text is this that if you do not trust in the Scriptures, if the Scriptures alone are not sufficient to bring you to a knowledge of God, you won't believe and repent if one rose from the dead. Nothing will convince you if the Word of God has not convinced you. We must affirm that apart from the Scriptures, there is no possibility of redemption. Now that's a controversial point, and many will try to argue that. They will say, well, what about that guy <laughs> that's living halfway across the, the world? If I've been asked this question once, it's been asked a hundred times. And he's never read the Bible. No one's ever preached the Bible to him. Are you saying he can't be redeemed? Well, I'm saying that his plight ought to be an earnest motivation for us to go into all the world with the Scriptures and preach it to every man. See, if, if it were possible for someone to be redeemed because they were entirely ignorant of the Scriptures, then the worst thing you could ever do would be to tell them about the Scriptures. Those of us who have children, uh, if, if your child could be saved having zero knowledge of the Scriptures, the worst thing you could ever do is go to family devotion and read the Bible to them. Yeah, you've just made them accountable. You've ruined it. <laughs> well, it's a good thing God didn't set it up that way. 
No, but man sits in darkness, devoid of God's truth, and God reveals His Word to His chosen people. In the Old Testament, Israel was committed the oracles of God. Now in the New Testament, He's committed His Word to His church, the priesthood of believers. And we are the ones who are tasked with the responsibility of going into the world and proclaiming the message of this book so that men might be saved. And the scriptures alone are sufficient, sufficient to do all the work that God has ever tasked us with. As we close, I want to look at several attacks on the sufficiency of the scripture. Anytime someone teaches that we need anything other than the scriptures alone to know God and serve God, they are attacking the sufficiency of Scripture. And it comes in various forms. But anytime they say that there's something besides the Bible that you need, not just saying it's good, okay? Not just, I mean, there's, uh, I love books. There's plenty of books that I would heartily recommend uh, to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I love books. But no theology book ever written is needful and necessary for faith in Christ. Only the Scriptures are sufficient for these things. So I want to look at three specific attacks to consider. And like I said, there's, these attacks come in all kinds of different forms, but I want to talk about three that are perhaps the most prevalent in our day and age. The first is the attack from the Roman Catholic Church. The attack from the Roman Catholic Church. And it's been an attack that they've been using for centuries. See, Rome explicitly denies sola scriptura. In fact, sola scriptura was coined to uh, protest the Roman Catholic Church. And Rome says that man not only needs the scripture, but he also needs the churches, and by that they mean their church, the Roman Catholic Church's interpretation of the scripture, and, and here's the real kicker, the extra-scriptural traditions that the church, according to them, has the authority to, to make, those things are also necessary to know God in a saving way. So not only do we need the scriptures, but you need the church's interpretation of the scriptures, and you need the traditions that the church has come up with in order to be saved. See, the Roman Catholic Church teaches various means of God's grace that are nowhere hinted at in the Bible. And you'll confront them with that and you'll say, nowhere in the Bible does it say that such and such, be it one of their many sacraments, one of their seven sacraments, nowhere does it say that any of these things are necessary for salvation. And on uh, several of them, they'll say, you're right. However, our church has the authority to vest efficacy in this sacrament. Because we don't believe that the scriptures alone are sufficient. And uh, that is an attack on the sufficiency of the word of God. It's also why Rome in the Middle Ages for centuries did everything they could to keep the Bible out of the hands of the common man. And we'll get into that as we look into the preservation of the scriptures. The second attack to consider is the attack from the charismatic movement the attack from the charismatic movement. And uh, I believe that there are many sincere, godly Christians who perhaps hold to a more charismatic position. But fundamentally, the charismatic movement is a denial of the sufficiency of Scripture. And this perhaps is the most uh, prevalent battleground where the, where the fight over the sufficiency of the Bible is being raged today. See, they argue that God is still giving new revelation. That God is still speaking to people with prophetic dreams and visions. And He's still giving the sign gifts and the revelatory gifts. He's still giving people the gift of tongues, which in the Bible, tongues was always a revelatory gift. It was always a means whereby God would commit new revelation. He would reveal something new. It wasn't uh, gibberish that was just uh, private talk, but it was always a public means of communicating new revelation. And the charismatic movement argues that these prophetic revelations are still being given today. Well, if that's true, then therefore the scriptures 
do not contain all that God wants us to know. In the book of Hebrews, God says uh, that He at sundry times and in diverse manners spake by the prophets. But He hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. Jesus Christ and His Word. And Jesus Christ is the Logos of God. He is the Word of God. He is the, the New Testament was shed in His blood. He's the final revelation from God to mankind. And so there is no more need for dreams. There is no more need for prophetic revelation because we have the complete, sufficient Word of God. Oftentimes, the charismatics will talk about the, what they call the authority of the Spirit. The authority of the Spirit. Saying that, well, I understand that the Bible says this, but I've received this prophetic vision and the, the authority of the Holy Spirit is able to override the written word in favor of this hot off the press prophetic vision. Well, that's not what the authority of the Spirit is at all. The authority of the Spirit applies the written word to our hearts and illuminates what God has already said in His word. And so we want to affirm that, that uh, the canon of Scripture is closed. God has given all that we will ever know, and the Word of God is sufficient. And the third attack on the sufficiency of Scripture is that attack which comes from the cults, the pseudo-Christian cults. Now, just recently, I was having a conversation with a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, a Mormon, and he was trying to say to me that uh, all of his beliefs came right from the Old and New Testament. However, that's just simply not true. The church itself will say that the Old and New Testament, though they're, they're, they're fine and dandy, they weren't all that we needed. And so a new prophet had to come and he had to record more divine revelation. And the, and, uh, the Mormons are not the only pseudo-Christian cult that, that teaches that. It's one of the hallmarks of a cult. Anytime someone says, we need something else Besides the Bible or in addition to the Bible, you mark it down. They are attacking the sufficiency of the Scriptures. So be very weary when any group would put something on par with the Word of God. We love our books. We love our confessions. But this is never going to even approach the uh, infinite perfection and sufficiency of the Scriptures. And Jesus answers all of these attacks on the Word of God and its sufficiency, when he says in Matthew 15 and verse 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. So this class, tonight we have affirmed that the scriptures are infallible, are inerrant, are perfect, are sufficient, are complete, and are final. And I pray that God will bless you in your study of his word, and I look forward to... Uh, meeting again next week. God bless you.